Dude, I feel stressed. I feel pressure. I still have bad mood swings sometimes, but that's part of it. And, and that reminds you how far you have to go and it keeps you humble and it keeps you grounded. And also it helps you empathize with people more because if you never felt that way, and then someone tells me if a young person comes up to me and says, Jay, I feel stressed. And I'm like, oh, come on, just get over it. Like there is no such thing as stress. That's not true. And so I find that when I feel stressed or fearful or anxious, I explore it a little deeper so that next time someone says that to me, I can actually feel empathy and compassion for them because I know how it feels. Jai Shetty, my brother, it's an honor having you on the Ranveer show. There's also so much that people like myself, motivation speakers all over the world, content creators all over the world have picked up from you. Uh, firstly, congratulations on your book. It's come out, it's become a bestseller. And uh, secondly, thank you, man. Like you, I don't, I'm sure you know the value you spread out, but I'm not 100% sure if you know about the magnitude of the value you spread in the world. Well, I want to thank you, man. I've been a fan of watching you and seeing what you've been doing and it's really inspiring. And so I'm grateful to be live with you, man. This is, uh, this is my honor and keep doing what you're doing. You're having such a big impact yourself and I'm, I'm glad that we're getting to do something together. I can't wait to meet you in person. Likewise, brother. Uh, I'm sure if this whole pandemic situation hadn't happened, you would have probably been in India at this point. <laughs> Definitely. Um, which, which is going to be a theme on this podcast. There's a lot of Indian fans of yours watching this. Um, the, the big question to you is, what has this country and this culture and this heritage given you that you carry through into your career, into your work, into the Jay Shetty who's staying in Los Angeles and talking to the Kardashians and athletes, what is Indian culture given to that person? Yeah, so I was born and raised in London, uh, but of course my heritage is Indian. Uh, my father was born in Pune, uh, but originally from Mangalore. And my mother was actually born in Yemen, but she's Gujarati. So there's a big Gujarati co <laughs> community that grew up in Yemen. And for me, India has given me every piece of wisdom that I try and share, that I'm trying to extend out to the world, all comes from the texts of India. So whether it's the Bhagavad Gita, mm. whether it's the Vedas, uh, whether it's any of those amazing literatures. And I think also that incredible understanding of growing up in an Indian home with good hospitality, uh, good values, mm. uh, the ability to welcome others into your life, to, to want to serve others, to want to have a positive impact on others. So really, I would say that everything that I'm doing is fueled by the incredible culture and love that I receive from India, India through its books and texts, but also through the people. So Jay, I want to ask you a lot more about the books, but I got to know about your time spent in an Indian ashram as a monk. How did you land up in that specific ashram and where was it? Yeah, absolutely. So I was studying in London and I was really interested by people's motivational journeys, people who went from nothing to something. And it wasn't the material success I was impressed by. I was impressed by people who had sacrificed, who'd broken through depression, who'd, who'd really worked on themselves. And so I was reading biographies and autobiographies, and I would go and hear people speak because I was really inspired by listening to amazing people with great insights. And once I was invited to hear this monk speak, and, and I thought, what am I going to learn from a monk? You know, like, what do, what do monks have to teach? And I went along anyway, because I told my friends, and, and I know your, your, your tag name is Beer Biceps. So I told, I told the team that, I told my friends, sorry, that I would only go if we went to have a drink afterwards. And, and they agreed with yeah. me. And so we went to this event to hear this monk speak. And the monk was from India. His name was Goranga Das. He uh, went to IIT, but had given up his degree to become a monk. And so I thought, you either have to be really crazy or really smart, because why would you do that? Why <laughs> would you give up your degree at IIT to become a monk? And so I got really interested by his sacrifice and, and his choice. And so I started asking him questions and spending time with him. And at the time, he was starting a new project 
which was two hours outside of Mumbai, uh, in a, in, I believe it's in the uh, vicinity of Palghar, but the area is called Vada. And this new project was to provide villages with a proper functioning village, a sustainable community, and a livelihood to actually give back to the communities, to teach people there about business, agriculture, to really help them make the most of their lives. And it was being constructed by monks. And so I got completely uh, blown away by the fact that these monks were not only going deep and doing meditation, but they were also serving and helping the world. And, and I thought to myself that how beautiful is that, that you can do both. You can take care of your mind and take care of your own inner life but that you can also try and make a difference in the world. And that's why I ended up in that monastery and that ashram, because I saw this perfect balance of self-care and self-mastery balanced with service and philanthropy and giving back to the world. Beautiful, Jay. I have to ask you this one question I've always uh, thought about when I watch your content, which is that it comes out of an extremely deep place. And often if a human being has the ability to think that deep or write that deep, uh, it's it's kind of uh, almost always the case where uh, the human beings also had like kind of a dark past. So has your past had any darkness in it? Like, have you gone through, I'm sure you have, you've had some baggage in the past. Possibly, you know, you've let go of it now through all the meditation you do, through the work you do, uh, because content cures the content <laughs> creator. But uh, I want to, I want to take you like way before you became a content creator. Was there any like darkness in your life? Yeah. So from a very, very early on, I remember being bullied at school. And I was around, I was probably around like five, six years old when I started to get bullied. And I used to get bullied because I was overweight and I was one of the few Indian people in my class. So I think in my whole school at five, six years old, I was one of three Indian people, maybe, maybe even just hmm. four of us. And so I was bullied for being overweight, for being Indian and people weren't used to seeing Indian people in my area. Uh, I was, I was always overweight growing up as a child. So people would bully me about the way I looked and, and my weight. And that was, that was definitely difficult to go through as a young person because, you know, for you, you don't understand any of that at that time. Like to you, it's like, oh, I was born with this skin and this color. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I should, you know, you're not thinking at six years old about having a six pack. You're, you're just happy with whatever you have. And so that was definitely tough. And then even in my teenage years, I started to get involved in the wrong circles because I never felt I really had like an older brother figure. I'm the eldest, I have a younger sister. Uh, I didn't really have anyone older that was guiding me or helping me or supporting me. And so I definitely felt that I got involved in the wrong circles. And some of those wrong circles ended up in getting involved in everything from drugs through to, you know, fights and, and that sort of scenario. And that was very dark because I've always been a good person at heart and I never wanted to be into hurting anyone or fights or drugs or any of that stuff. I'm not, it's not really my natural inclination. And so when you find yourself in those places and you don't know what's happening next, that was a dark place. And, and beyond all of that, I think the darkest thing was just that I constantly felt like no one really understood my decisions. And I think for all of us, not just for me, I think the darkest place to live is where you feel people don't understand you. And, and I think a lot of people today that go through mental health challenges or depression or stress or pressure, it's because they feel no one understands them. And, and the truth is that those are sometimes the most powerful moments of our life because it's when people don't understand you that you try to take the time to really try and understand yourself. And, and that's where so much strength comes from is understanding yourself and taking the time to validate yourself. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Um, now you said that, you know, the books from India inspire you. One of the concepts that I've picked up from those books, it's kind of like a deep concept, but uh, it basically said that the rewards that you receive in life are equally a result of your hard work, but also your karma. How good you've been as a person, how honest you've been as a person, how truthful you've been. Um, 
you have broken out as a content creator all over the world and there's a lot of other people who are trying to do what you're doing there have been tons of other people so i want to ask you from this perspective of this learning what have you done correct in life have you been guided by the right people have you constantly kind of held on to your own ideals your own ethics like what's gone right for you according to yourself yeah yeah good question i i'd say that in in my heart and my intention i've i've only wanted to do good for others and serve others and support others so whenever i even when i started creating content or even when i worked in the city or when i became a monk my my intention was always to serve and to help others my intention was never motivated by uh big results or anything that's happened in my life today i never thought it would happen and and i never even believed that that was the goal or that was the reason i was doing it the reason i was doing it was i believed that i uncovered this incredible wisdom and i wanted to share it that was it and so i think sometimes our intention gets uh dirty or messy uh sometimes really our intention is ego driven or sometimes it's a uh, money driven or sometimes it's results driven and none of those things are bad you can have money you can be famous you can be successful but if that is your reason for doing it if that is your intention for doing it it won't satisfy you even if you get there and actually if you do it for a deeper reason you'll probably get there faster and you'll be happier when you actually receive it and so one thing for me is and i work on this every day it's not that i've mastered it but every day i'm working on my intention to always be of service to always want to help so that's one thing uh the second thing i'd say is that i met all the best teachers and mentors in my life the coaches and the guides that i had in my life they all always remind me of how far i have to go so i'm not surrounded by yes people i'm surrounded by people who'll say jay this is great but but how deep is your meditation or this is great but but how much have you really overcome your ego So they're always checking me in a positive way. They encourage me, they give me hope, but they also humble me at the same time. And I think that having people like that in your life who know your passion and your purpose, but they also know how to bring out your greatest potential is really important. And and the third thing I'd say is that I've really worked on my craft. I think people forget that, you know, I was fortunate enough to go to public speaking school from age 11 through to age 18 because my parents forced me. So I've done seven years of public speaking training. From the age of eighteen to twenty-eight, I gave lectures and classes for three hours a day when I had zero followers and made zero money and had no online following. So I was doing it because I loved it, and I didn't even know that anyone would ever care. But for ten years, from age eighteen to twenty-eight, every day I was studying, learning, speaking, sharing, and most importantly, it's only sharing what you're applying in your life. So sometimes we we try and share ideas that we haven't experienced yet. And and for me it's always been to try and share ideas that I'm practicing and experimenting and trying to learn and I and I think that works. So these are all things that I haven't mastered but they're things that I'm constantly working on, but I think they're sometimes forgotten when people see the last 4 years, but we don't look at the last 15 years and then you miss out on that journey. 100%. Uh according to you is your life easy or difficult today? <laughs> That's a good question. Man. You're brilliant by the way. I love watching so I've watched a lot of your interviews. I think you're great. Uh is Thank is you. my life easy or difficult? I would say that my life is Can I I mean I okay, I don't want to give you that answer because I would challenge if someone gave me that answer, I would challenge them as well. I would say <laughs> that my life is um I would say my life is purposeful which has both elements. So so what I mean by that is my life is easy because I know what I want to do, what I stand for, I know what I believe in, but it's difficult because I have to put in hours, I have to put in work, I have to be organized, I have to live a disciplined life. Uh but discipline funnily enough actually makes life easier. So people think dif- discipline is difficult. but but the result of discipline is that life becomes easier and so waking up every day and meditating or going to the gym is difficult it's difficult it's not easy it's 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 challenging but the result of that is life becomes easier so i'd say that i'm dedicated to difficult discipline but that because it's purposeful and it has meaning 
become makes life easier to live if that answers your question it does it does yeah. but um and i'm asking you this for selfish reasons <laughs> because i i i have i have difficult days even today you know with with so many blessings around me established businesses there are days where i'll wake up not feeling completely motivated slash not feeling completely worthy yeah. uh i'm just asking you this kind yeah. of as a younger brother oh yeah for like, sure bro uh, you- for sure i still have that i wake up days where i feel stressed where i feel under pressure where i feel like i've got just got so much to do and you know i haven't got the support i need or you know all of that like i i experience all of that and and what i say to people is that training your mind and your body is not about never feeling that way again it's not that one day that won't happen it's that you let it affect you for less time so in the past you and me maybe when it happened when bad things would happen you'd be thinking about it for like a whole month but now when something happens you think about it for a week and then in a year from now you'll think about it for one day and then in a year from now you'll think about it for one hour and then a year from now you'll think about it for one minute and that's the goal the goal is not to never feel stress the goal is to feel it for less and less time because the point is that most of us allow stress and pressure to consume us and so the less you let it consume you is the goal but the problem is that when you have the goal that i should wake up and feel perfect every day that goal puts its own pressure and stress into your life so i wake up man i i'm with you like as 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 you said as a younger brother which i appreciate you saying that means a lot to me but as as an older brother like i would say dude i feel stressed i feel pressure i still have bad mood swings sometimes but that's part of it and and that reminds you how far you have to go and it keeps you humble and it keeps you grounded and also it helps you empathize with people more because if you never felt that way and then someone tells me if a young person comes up to me and says jay i feel stressed and i'm like oh come on just get over it like there is no such thing as stress that's not true and so i find that when i feel stressed or fearful or anxious i explore it a little deeper so that next time someone says that to me i can actually feel empathy and compassion for them because i know how it feels and so actually i i actually feel like going through pain is the best thing for a content creator because that's how you truly empathize with people if you don't go through pain then you can never relate to anyone i've got to ask you another tough question now where do you see jay shetty at age 80 <laughs> so hopefully i'm still somewhat healthy and and <laughs> alive that's that's the first thing i would like to see myself as healthy and alive and i would hope that i've truly been able to serve and support the leaders of the next generation so i truly believe that i'm not the smartest person in the world and i'm not going to invent everything that's needed in the world but if i can be someone who is behind those people and support them and encourage them and guide them and and keep refining their intention with them then that would be my greatest offering that if if we can discover the talent of this world and encourage those people to become leaders to really build a a just world a collaborative world a world where humans recognize their similarities more than their differences but celebrate their differences to me to me if we can find those leaders and invest in them and nourish them and and support them and serve them then we'll see some amazing change in the world so at age 80 i hope that that's what i get to do and i hope that i'm surrounded by lots of people who want to change the world and in a positive way and that i can be of some use to them that's gorgeous and you're already on that path i'm sure you've already affected a lot of lives um i was reading this book yesterday it's called 21 lessons from the 21st century it's by yuval noah harari yeah and he's he's got a chapter in there about god and he's spoken about how the term god is kind of got a negative connotation in the modern day often because people associate the term god with really radical religious groups that you know will use the term god as to put their own intense uh, ideals out there so uh, firstly do you, what's your 
sense of god like what's your definition of it and uh, secondly like how do you think the world is going to change its own definition of god going forward that's a great question so yuval noah harari came on my podcast actually so i spoke to him yeah. uh, and he's phenomenal he's he's actually a really incredibly deep person as well he he meditates strongly about i think he goes away into hiding for about 60 days a year to just meditate so he's phenomenal and we've had we've had some really nice conversations offline as well uh so yeah big fan of his book and big fan of him um but yeah i th- i think your question's really good and i think what he's saying is really important to me god is at at the very essence of it god is the recognition that there is a source and a power and an energy that is divine and there's something beyond us something beyond us something inside of us and something that connects everything in the universe and so at the very essence of that god is god is uh has has that recognition of the understanding of something beyond us something within us and something around us and to me whether you then for specific people giving god a name giving th- those are beautiful things i truly believe that uh god is a supreme personality um and and is someone that you can have a relationship with and so i think that to me whether you have a relationship with the universe whether you focus on having a relationship with your inner self or you focus on having a relationship with uh, a a supreme personality or a divine source it's all about a relationship it's not about fear it's not about anxiety it's not about pressure it's not about being scared of god it's not about it's about building a relationship with something that is beyond us and i think that the reason why uh the definition of god will change as as the world goes on is i think people got really affected by the rules and the ritualistic practices that made people lose the essence of what this really was uh and i think for all of us in our generation you know i i i think we all want to be more spiritual and conscious uh but we want to do it from a deep place not just a following rules space uh and and i also think that it will change because we have to find a we we all need a path if you look at some of the most successful athletes musicians most accomplished people in the world they all have a deep faith or spiritual practice so you'll see that meditation prayer uh all of these practices are deep parts of some of the most happy and successful people in the world and so for me the more personal it becomes the more um the more individual it becomes it it will become a really really beautiful thing in people's lives Yeah that's the big hope honestly like i remember on a very personal level i had an ayahuasca experience which completely changed my definition of god when i was 22 i was very lucky to have that experience really early in life uh shifted a lot of things for me and as my career has kind of gone forward i've honestly seen miracles happen around me that are only believable when it happens to you and you're <laughs> in my shoes and you've seen my journey uh um, but even today i have like some fantastic kids who we recruit for our companies and all who maybe initially don't have a sense of god and slowly they develop it and kind of becomes a huge anchor for them through their own journeys so that's my big hope man like i i hope that content creators are kind of able to uh put that idea out there not in a forceful way but in exactly the way you did it so uh from this question i got what i wanted <laughs> but um uh, man i got to move on to the next uh, big question which is meditation firstly what kind of meditation do you practice today and what's the end goal of meditation this is a very common question on the indian internet like what happens at the end of it yeah okay so i practice three types of meditation breath work visualization and then mantra uh because i think all of them have different uses in my life so breath work i practice when i feel stress pressure uh any sort of anxiety breath work is the best way to have an immediate response so for example let's say i'm going on stage in front of thousands of people and i'm feeling a little nervous then i will just breathe in for a count of 4 and i'll breathe out for more than 4 
and I'll feel absolutely set and I'll feel ready to go out. And I've done that time and time again, whenever I'm in that situation. Visualization is, is really powerful. Uh, it can be used for a few things. So one of the first things I use visualization for is if, and I've worked with clients with it as well. So let's say someone is upset about the last thing they said to someone who passed away or was not in their life anymore. And they can't say what they wanted to say. Visualization is an incredible way to revisit the past and, and change how you behaved in that situation. It doesn't change your life, but it changes the experience of that memory. So that's one way of using visualization. The second way of using visualization is if you think that something's difficult, if you visualize yourself doing it over and over again, it starts to become easier. So I often say to people, visualize yourself waking up early. Visualize yourself working out in the morning. Don't visualize yourself with a six pack or, a, or biceps. Or all that. That's a waste of time, but visualize yourself doing the work. And when you visualize yourself doing the work, you'll start to make it happen in your life because everything that you've created existed here first. And the third way that I use visualization is often I will visualize if I'm doing something today, like coming on this podcast, then what I do sometimes at the beginning of the day is I look at my schedule and I visualize what will be my intention when I come to each thing that I'm doing. And so that I'm already prepared so that when I come to you, my intention is already set and I'm ready from that standpoint. So that's visualization. And the mantra, I mean, there are so many beautiful mantras in, in the Vedic literatures and in the Gita. And, and I always recommend to people that to find your own mantra, to find your affirmation that becomes your anchor is, is truly, really beautiful. And for me, one of my favorite ones that I've been sharing a lot recently from a mantra point of view is the uh, Sarva Sukhino Bhavantu Mantra, uh, which is so beautiful because I think the world needs a lot of peace and love. And, and then my favorite affirmation for myself is I'm exactly where I need to be. Uh, and the reason why I repeat that to myself is because I think we always think we're ahead or behind. We always think like we're late, we're rushing. And so I always repeat to myself, I'm exactly where I need to be. This is where I'm meant to be right now. I'm meant to be with you right now. This is, this is where I am. And when you remind yourself that, then you're very present. Now, the end of meditation is an interesting question. And, and the way I would liken that is imagine saying, well, what is the end of eating food? Right? What is the end of eating food? When, when will it be a point where you never need to eat again because you've eaten enough food? And the truth is there is no end to eating food. You eat food every day because it fills you up and it nourishes you and it takes care of your body. Similarly, you meditate every day because it gives you more clarity of mind, more connection with your soul and more stillness. And so in one sense, there is no end to meditation like there is no end to anything good in life. And I, I think we, we sometimes mistake meditation or, or anything in our life as having an end but the best things in life, we eat every day, we sleep every day, uh, you know, you have to shower every day. Like these are habits for daily life. And if you say, what is the goal of meditation? The goal of meditation is to connect to God and your truest self without any other unmotivated or uninterrupted agenda. And so the problem right now is that, and I give this example in the book, uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful uh, from, a, from a prayer. And it talks about how when you first come across a mirror, if you go to a mirror in your loft or in the basement, you'll see that it has lots of dust on it. And sometimes when we're looking at ourselves right now, we don't know who we are because the mirror is dusty. And when you start to clean the mirror, that's what meditation is. Meditation is cleaning the mirror. And when you start cleaning the mirror, the first thing that happens is the dust comes in your face. So when you first start meditating, you might even be like, oh God, this is so difficult and I can't see anything and I don't understand anything. But after cleaning, you can see yourself clearly. So that is the goal of meditation. And meditation is that process of inner cleansing and healing so you can truly see yourself. That's a gorgeous answer. Um, if someone wants to get deeper into meditation in general, other than, you know, just creating a habit and uh, focusing on your breath, What's your advice for that person? How do they jump into those advanced meditations? Yeah, my, my biggest advice would be, and I know that it's difficult right now, so I, I appreciate that, but 
it's really important to go on a one day retreat or a one week retreat and just go deep because we live in this world right now where it's like, do this for five minutes a day, do this for three minutes a day. And even sometimes I recommend people to do things for short amounts to make it easy for them. But, but the truth is, let's say you like a guy or a girl, like you're thinking about dating them. And let's say someone said to you, just spend five minutes with her every day. Just spend five minutes with him every day. How long will it take you to figure out whether you love her and whether you want to marry her or whatever it is? It will take you your whole life because what are you going to learn in five minutes? So similarly with meditation, the more immersive you get, the more deep you get in a, in a consistent period of time. So I always say to people, instead of trying to do meditation once a week for the whole year, do it for one week in a full year, like in a full go. And when you do that, you'll feel the benefits like you did in your own experiences. You'll feel the benefits and then you'll keep it going for five minutes a day. So the biggest mistake we make is we say, I'll do it once a month. I'll do it once a year. Do it for seven days and you will feel the benefit. If you exercise, like I know that you're into fitness. If, if you want to get fit, if you exercise for a week, you'll see and feel the benefits and then you'll keep it going. But if you say, oh, I'll go to the gym once a week, once a month, you'll never feel the benefits. You'll never see the experience. And so you'll never get committed to the activity. That's gorgeous. Uh, you mentioned marriage and love and relationships. I've got to get into that domain with you. Uh, there's a lot of, again, brotherly questions I want to ask you. <laughs> yeah, Before we please, get man. to the marriage questions, I've got to ask <laughs> you pre-marriage questions. Do you believe that men and women have different thought processes or different ways of perceiving the world? I, I believe that there are definitely masculine and feminine energy and you may find both in both men and women. So it's not necessarily that all men think the same and all women think the same, but I believe there are more masculine energies and thoughts and more feminine energies and thoughts. And we all have a, a mix of all of them. But I do think that we think about things differently. Yeah, for sure. I think psychology is far more uh, individual than we try and think it is. Yeah, I think and meditation kind of balances you out uh, in terms of if you have too much of a masculine thought process, it will give you that feminine perspective and vice versa. And that's been an experience I've had. Uh, I think I just developed things like empathy, compassion, endurance, um, you know, love, uh, emotional expression, all these very feminine aspects of thought later after I started meditation. meditation. And before that, uh, I had like much more masculine kind of thoughts, which are also great. Bravery, determination, um, you know, just strength, going for it, like taking risks. But you'll only be able to live a balanced life when you balance out those two energies inside you. Yeah. That's what I feel. Do you, do you kind of agree with that? I, I agree with uh, trying to find both of them inside of us for sure. Like I, I think mm. they have such powerful uses at different times. And actually when you notice them inside yourself, you start to appreciate other people more. Yep, you know, I yep, think we all, we all grew up in this mindset, this negative mindset of like, stop being a girl. People would say things like that. Like, stop, stop being so soft. And there's a mistake there because when you say that, you're now not noticing the value of that quality. And so when you notice both in yourself, you start to celebrate that outwardly as well. The question about marriage is, as a man, what do you have to do for your wife? Like, what do you have to change about yourself? And I know it's a very broad question. So I'm asking you everything from, uh, you know, like, do you have to give up on some of your own space? I'm, I'm sure you have to give it time. You have to give it energy. But uh, what are those things that you only realize as a guy after you're married? <laughs> so the first thing I'd say is, and, and I talk about this often, that there are four important decisions you make in life. And so anyone who's listening or watching right now, when you're making any of these decisions, don't rush them, don't do them out of pressure, and don't do them quickly. Like, really think about them. So the first one is how you feel about yourself. That is one of the biggest decisions you make, is how you feel about your own self. The second most important decision you make is what you do for money. The third most important decision you make is who you give your love to and who gives you love. So this question that we're talking about. And the fourth one is how you serve the world. These are not decisions that should be made out of any other reason apart from personal contemplation. So the first thing I'd say is when you like someone, that's the time to really think about it. So let's go right to the beginning of it, right? It's like, don't wait till marriage 
to figure out what you're going to have to change. Because maybe then you'll have to change something you don't want to change. So when I met my wife, uh, Radhi, uh, Radhi Devlukya Sherry, if anyone follows her on Instagram, then you, you know I, she I is. follow on Instagram. I love <laughs> her content. <laughs> She's amazing. She's the best. And so when me and her met, so we met, uh, we actually met before I became a monk when we weren't dating. I just knew her. And then we've been together now for seven years and married for four years. So we've, we've spent a bit of time together in our life. And when we first met and we were attracted to each other and we liked each other, I was really honest with her about who I was and what was important to me in life. And this is the first step. If you don't know who you are and what's really important to you in life, then you'll never know who's right for you. And no one can ever know if they're right for you either. And so I was really honest. I said to her, I said, my purpose, even though at that time I wasn't a content creator, I said, my purpose is to serve people. I want to teach. I want to share. I, I, I want to focus on developing this part of my life. And this is my number one priority in life. And she said to me that her number one priority was her family, her parents, her sister, her, she loves her mom and dad and her, her grandmother. And she was like, that's her, her, her heart in life. And I said, I promise you that I will always help you get closer to them. And you promise me that you'll always help me get closer to this. And so it was a really honest conversation. Now that doesn't mean that it's been easy, but it means that we had a direction from the beginning. So now, if I had a priority with my, with my purpose that was coming up and I couldn't go to her family event, she respected that and supported me. And if I had a big event and, and she couldn't come with me because she had family stuff, then I respected her and loved her because the goal of the relationship was get her closer to her goal and she helps me get closer to my goal. Not that we trade our goals and just work on each other. And so actually what you're giving up on is your ego and your sense of control. That's really what a relationship is. Because the ego says, well, she's my wife, she should come with me to this event and see me on stage and me giving these lectures and blah, blah, blah. But that's not true. The truth is if I love her, I should be helping her get closer to what she matters to her. And, and same with her, she would support me. So really what you're giving up is that sense of proprietorship, that sense of ego and control because love means understanding the person's goal in love. So to me, that's what really has been the, the guiding force of our marriage. And that may change also. So I check in with Radhi and she'll check in with me. Like my, my goal has pretty much stayed the same. But if hers changes or evolves, I have to change and evolve with that if I love her. That's the point. Uh, and then obviously there are day-to-day -day things like space and all of that kind of stuff. But again, if you have a very clear guiding light, if you have a very clear direction, all of these things kind of just work themselves out. And those are the things, again, you have to discuss. Like I, I always said to Radhi that I'm a terrible cook. You don't even want me to try and cook. Like I'm just terrible. Like that's not my strength. It's not my skill. And, and that was just me being honest with her. That doesn't mean I wouldn't if she wanted me to, but because that's her passion. She, that's her that's her purpose and her passion so she's happy to to do that and so i think it's really important in a relationship beginning or middle or wherever you are to just be honest about who you are and what you want and that person to be honest about who they are and what they want and remember you're just trying to help them get closer to their goal it's not about you compromising because what ends up happening in relationships is both the man and the woman or the man and the man or the woman and the woman, everyone compromises. And when you compromise, then you always feel in your heart like, oh, because of them, I gave up what was important to me. And that doesn't build a loving relationship. Yeah, 100%. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. And this is something that someone once told me, and I'm still coming to terms with it. And I don't know if it's an actual thing. But is it true that um, your growth rate needs to match as a partnership? Because, I mean, dude, honestly, the blessing and the curse of a content creation career is that behind the scenes, you've got to keep studying, you've got to keep growing, you've got to keep adding things to your own mind. So it puts you in this very weird position of you have created your own championship <laughs> belt and to earn it every day, you have to live up to it. Now, that puts a lot of load on your relationship and your partner in terms of, okay, keep up with me. So yeah. what do you think of this whole growth rate theory? 
Yeah, yeah. So I've I've found or I've noticed, and I was I was thinking about this a couple of years ago that I've seen three types of relationship. So one is where you are the parent to your partner. So it's almost like you're like their dad or their mom. So they need handholding, they need support, they need you to guide them and show them the way. And you have to decide, is that something you want in life? The second type of relationship I've seen is where you are the child. So actually you need the parenting, you need someone to guide you, right? So that's another type of relationship. And the third type of relationship I've seen is where you're partners, where you're both equally balancing out the parental and the child aspect and you both support each other. The point is, which one do you want? I, I want the third one. So that's that's thankfully what I have is that Radhi carries me and I carry her and we support each other and we balance each other out. But some people want to be the parent, the nurturer, the supporter, the provider. And some people want to be the child. And we have to ask ourselves, which one of these is sustainable for us? And the truth is that being a child is not a sustainable relationship because eventually someone will get tired and bored of you and will feel overwhelmed and just exhausted taking care of you. And also you may find that you get exhausted taking care of someone else. So I, I believe that trying to find a partnership where you both carry and both serve and support gives for more sustainability. And that also requires more work. Like me and Radhi haven't figured it all out. We've had to have so many tough conversations over the last few years and communicate about expectations. And we also have to realize that people are growing in different ways at different times. So when I met Radhi, I was more spiritual. And today I would say that Radhi has far superseded me in so much of my own spirituality. And, and she teaches me. And so the point is that you have to recognize as long as that person is growing, their growth may not look like your growth. Their growth may not be the same. So for example, your growth and my growth may look like studying books but their growth may be doing charity work. And so everyone's growth looks different. So you can't judge someone's growth based on how you're growing. And so it's important that you're both growing, but you may look very different when you're growing. Got it. You mentioned spirituality. Very simple question. What is spirituality for a human being? What is the spiritual journey? What does it mean to be spiritual? The, the monk definition that was taught to me is that spiritual means where the spirit is behind the ritual. So where, these, where the ritual is done with understanding, intention, and depth, that it is done with a deeper sense of understanding. The ritual is just the, the, the puja, the arti, that's the ritual. But when it is done in a spiritual way, with the spirit of love, of compassion, of devotion, that is what spirituality is. So spirituality is infusing these very powerful uh, acts and these very powerful um, these very powerful activities of devotion, but actually doing them with devotion. That is spirituality. Gorgeous. Um, I got to ask you about veganism because Radhi is uh, one of the famous vegans of Instagram. <laughs> um, and honestly, it's something uh, I've, I've, I've turned vegetarian since the last two and a half years. I felt wow. like getting deeper into spirituality, my body just rejected meat. <laughs> And wow. uh, I'm Punjabi, so I've grown up eating more meat than you can imagine. But just one day I was looking at that chicken breast and I said to myself, no, you know, this is not going to happen. Gradually gave up all kinds of meat over like the next year. And I've reached a stage where I don't have eggs. I do have a little bit of milk and I don't know if milk is something that I will give up in the long term. Uh, but uh, vegetarianism is something that gave me a lot of gifts and it's something I only understood after I actually took it up with full force. So I got to ask you about your journey in this vegan vegetarian transformation. Yeah, so I grew up eating meat as well. Uh, Radhi grew up vegetarian. She's been vegetarian her whole life and vegan for nearly maybe about 10 years now, maybe something like that. Uh, but I have I grew up eating meat, so I've, I've eaten everything. Uh, and I became vegetarian at about 15 years old out of choice. So for me, it was very simple. I would, uh, my school journey on the way back from school, I would walk past a butcher's every day. And so I would see the animals hanging in the window. And when I saw that, that was the first time I registered. I was like, oh, that chicken that's hanging there, that's the chicken that I'm eating in my chicken sandwich from McDonald's. 
And I, I remember the first time I came to India, uh, McDonald's had just opened in Bandra. And so I'd, I'd, gone to, I'd gone to McDonald's and, you know, I was like nine years old at that time or whatever, but it was such a direct link for me. And so I was like, okay, well, I don't want to do that anymore. So I became vegetarian at 15. And then I became vegan when I married Radhi because it was easier to do it with someone who was educated in how to do it in a healthy way. And so what I've, I'm, I'm not a, um, I don't consider myself to be a proponent or a uh, ambassador. I consider myself to be someone who's trying to practice it themselves. And for me, my, my recommendation to everyone, like you, like you did for yourself, is to do what is right for you at the right time when you really reflect on it and to do it in a way that's healthy and sustainable so that you feel the physical benefits as well as the moral benefits of it. Because there's, you know, some people become vegan or vegetarian for health and some do it for morality. And for me, it's benefited both. For me, it's benefited from, from on me on both levels. Uh, but I really just allow people to come to it at their own time because I, I grew up eating meat as well. So I don't, I don't judge anyone or I don't feel anything negative towards anyone uh, who, who eats me. I think it's a personal choice and you have to get there in your own time. Yeah, 100%. That's something I agree with. And yeah. that's also, I mean, me speaking as a former meat eater, if someone told me to give up meat, I'd probably get pissed <laughs> off back then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So as, as a newly turned vegetarian, I never throw my ideas on anyone. But what I do like doing is I like sharing honest experiences where I felt like I did have a change in my thought process or the way I'm, I perceive the world. And of course, my health as well. I definitely yeah. lost some amount of muscle, but in retrospect, it's a decision I would never change if I, if, if I, if I ever go back. Um, That's beautiful. What's man. it, yeah. What's it done for you? Like physically, mentally, spiritually, what's, what's that effect been like for you? Yeah. So, so starting physically, I, I actually found that giving up dairy products stopped me from getting ill as often. So like the flu or mucus or bad throats and sore throats and aches. And I used to get a lot of, um, I used to find myself feeling a lot of mucus and uh, just feeling quite, I would get unwell more regularly since, you know, thankfully by, since I've gone vegan, I've thankfully not, not, not experienced too much physical um, ill health. So that's been great. Uh, on a mental level, I definitely feel lighter. You know, I feel lighter and clearer. I feel I have more clarity and more, um, I feel like I have more uh, stillness and less less kind of aggression in my life. I've never been a very aggressive person anyway, but I definitely am a lot more, even more calmer. And, and spiritually, it's just given me a love for really appreciating animals. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's so beautiful to see equally these incredible create, uh, creatures and creations and to appreciate them and to appreciate the life in them to, and to appreciate that source of energy in them that, you know, that lion or that, um, that chicken or that, you know, cow or whatever it is has life. It feels pain. It feels love. It feels motherly love. If you've never, if you've never seen a cow caring for its calf or if you've never seen a, a kangaroo caring for its baby kangaroo, you know, it's like there's a beautiful joy to watch that. And when you when you deeply look at that, you you start really appreciating uh, that there is that beautiful living force just that we have inside of us. It's inside of them as well. That's a gorgeous answer. Um, Jay, because we're running out of time, I've got to ask you a bunch of social media businessy questions. Uh, yeah. But let's let's begin it with you know when you meet people like Kobe Bryant, when you meet all these amazing human beings that you've already had on your show. Um, firstly, how does it change you? And secondly, how have you seen the world's perception of you changing? I, I think the way it changes me is that I genuinely think that sometimes we often look at anyone who is successful or who has achieved something in life. We sometimes, sometimes I remember at least in London, I don't know what it's like in India, but I remember sometimes our friends and everyone would be like, oh yeah, but who cares anyway? And like, you know, maybe they didn't do it properly or they got lucky or, you know, that, oh, they just, they just got the right introduction. And you, you kind of try and pass it off. Like there was, there was no depth there. Uh, and sometimes we do that about musicians or whatever it may be. And from everyone that I've met, 
I've, I've seen people who have really sacrificed, who've really worked, who've really disciplined themselves, who've meditated daily, who've invested in their self-growth. Who, people have really done the work. And, and so the way it impacts me is that it, it gives me more affirmation and gives me more confirmation that the work you and I are doing is deeply important and is deeply needed because all these people who have achieved impact in the world, they've all done it themselves. So for me, it's just a very grounding and humbling feeling that we're so lucky that we got introduced to these themes and subjects at an early age, because these are the things that have kept these people grounded in themselves. And, you know, I, I haven't given much thought of how it uh, affects how people see me because, you know, for me, I've been living such a follow my heart, intuition, life, my whole life. Uh, and I've been really grateful that a lot of these people who've been on the show as well, they're not just people on the show, they've become friends, like dear friends. And and so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's it's never been about the the PR or the 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 kind of angle. It's it's been the fact that I've wanted to learn from these people, and so I hope that it's I hope that it's helped people understand that I'm a student, a student of of life and of all these people, and that that would be the best thing that people could take away from it to show that you know even though people may think that I'm sharing and I'm just always learning, like that's, that's the goal. And so, so I really hope that that's what people see is my intention. Yeah. I think that's what you're spreading out there. You're spreading that student learner mentality, Jay. Uh, and finally, I've got to ask you about the social media game. Uh, what's your intuition about the future of the world of content? What's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years? What are you planning for yourself? How do you think someone can grow? Uh, and secondly, just, you know, what have been your hacks for growing this fast on social media? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I'd say about where social media is going, I, I think the biggest thing we all know is that there's going to be new platforms and there's going to be new, uh, yeah, new platforms, new apps. We, we've all seen the rise of TikTok and now we're seeing this awkward moment where they're trying to figure out whether it's going to stay or not. And then we've seen the rise of reels on Instagram and, you know, you've got just platforms and platforms. So the first thing you have to realize is if you want to be a content creator, don't be choosy and picky about the platform that helps you grow. So when I was starting out, YouTube was the hot platform and Facebook was considered the not hot platform. But for me, my work grew on Facebook, which then grew my YouTube and grew my Instagram. And so I wasn't picky about, oh, I want to be cool on it and big on YouTube. I was just like, wherever you feel the love, be there. You know, so you may start feeling some love on TikTok, go all in on TikTok. You may feel the love on Twitter, go all in on Twitter. Don't, don't think in your mind that, oh, this is not the cool platform. I want to be on this platform. And so I knew a lot of people at the time who were thinking, oh, no, no, I want to be big on YouTube. Forget Facebook. It's a waste of time. And, you know, for me, Facebook was a platform that changed my life. And so it's really important in the beginning to find the platform that works for you and your content and go all in on that platform. And then you'll see the outpouring of that platform onto all of your platforms. So we saw that when my Facebook platform grew exponentially, the Instagram grew, YouTube grew, Twitter, everything grew because of that one powerful growth. And so often we spread ourselves too thin and we start making content that doesn't work on any platform because we're trying to deal with all platforms. And my advice is in the beginning, when you can do very less, just try and make content that wins on one platform and just go all in. So what some of the strategies to share with you, the first strategy was we always tested lots of different styles of content. So you never know what's going to work. And even now I'm always testing and experimenting styles. So Recently, I started this new format, which is putting me into movies. So it was me giving advice to Spider-Man, me giving advice to Jennifer Aniston, me giving advice. And it was just all in this movie format. And I did that because I wanted to do more comedy and I wanted to do something more lighthearted. And people aren't used to seeing me do that. And we made three videos as a test. We just made three videos and we put them out and they did really, really well and people loved them. So we're going to do more of them. And so the first thing is you have to be constantly experimenting. Sometimes I'll experiment and no one will like it. 
And so then I have to ask myself that, did, do I still want to do that? Does it fulfill a part of me? And if it makes me feel happy, then I'll keep doing it. But if it's not making me happy and no one likes it, then why am I doing it anymore? So that's, that's the experimenting mentality. The second is, and I can't stress this enough, is get to know your audience and your community. If you have a hundred followers and you don't talk to them and you don't message them and you don't read the comments, then you will never know what people are really looking for and what they're appreciating. And so for me, I'm on the Instagram. I mean, when I was DMing you, like we DM'd, it was, it was us talking. It's not like we're saying, oh, some team member can do that. I'm commenting, I'm replying, I'm reading people's comments. I think that that's a really important part of getting to know your audience and then knowing topics and understanding what they're looking for. The third one that's been really, really important to me is uh, collaborations and support. And I think too many people are trying to compete and, and I really believe that it's far more collaboration and collaboration happens on an equal level. So when I was growing, there were a lot of us growing at the same time. So it was Goldcast, me, uh, Prince EA, uh, who else was there at the time? Those, those were probably like the three people that were growing and we all supported each other. We all helped each other. So we became friends. And, and to me, it's like we all started around, me and Goldcast especially started around the same time, around four years ago, three, four years ago. And we just supported each other. And, and then you saw like, you know, Goldcast is really well known now. And, but I, I saw them at like 10,000 followers, 20,000 followers, like, and they've seen me at that too. But we always realized that our strength was in working together. And so when you're starting out, look for people that are on your level and say, wait, let's support each other rather than competing with each other. And so we would share each other's videos. Uh, we would share each other's posts and then we all grew at the same time. Uh, so that was really important. And, and then the biggest one is just, you have to get addicted to data. You have to look at the data. You can't just keep creating and not looking at watch time. You have to look at, are people watching the whole video or are they stopping at this point? Why? Uh, there's a company in America, uh, some, one of my team members used to work for this company and he was telling me about it. And they had something called the board test, boring test. So what they would do in their company is they would watch the new video as a team. And whenever someone got bored, they had to put their hand up. And so then they would look at like, why, why are we getting bored at this point? What can we change? And so you have to get addicted to data and look at, okay, if I grew X amount of uh, my audience last week, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? How do we repeat it? And so you have to get focused on the data. And all of this should never become one of two things. Content creators make two mistakes. We either become selfish or we become sellouts. And what that means is sellout means you just make whatever content your audience likes and you're not no, not growing anymore. And selfish is where you just make content that you want to watch, but no one wants to watch it. And so that's not, there's no point in that either. And so the real content creator is someone who looks at insights, but then follows their own intuition. Someone who looks at data, but then tries to be dynamic. That balance is what creates the content creator of the future. That's a beautiful answer. I want to end the podcast by asking you your three quickest pieces of advice from the Bhagavad Gita, because I know you've mentioned it a lot in your book. So uh, what do you have to share about the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, so one of my, I'm going to share three verses. So one of the first verses that I absolutely love is um, uh, better to follow your own path uh, imperfectly than to follow someone else's path perfectly. And I think... This verse is the embodiment of the disease of comparison we see in the world today, that we start chasing something because we see someone and we think, okay, I want that too. You know, if I was honest with you, bro, like I love football, like soccer, football is my, my like life. I love it. Like if I could have been Cristiano Ronaldo, I would have loved to have played football. But I noticed very early on that I didn't have the work ethic or the talent to play at a professional level. And so being honest with myself has allowed me to create this life that I have today. But if I keep trying to lie and trying to do that, you just get lost. So that's the first piece of advice from the Gita. Uh, the second piece of advice, which is the famous quote from the Gita is, um, your mind can be your best friend or your worst enemy. I think learning to befriend your mind is the most important skill in life because whether you want to develop habits, whether you want to become successful or happy or joyful, 
if you don't know how to befriend the mind, you'll struggle. And so in the book, I have a whole chapter dedicated to befriending the mind. And the third and final uh, verse that I would share or message is that ultimately it's all about service. It's all about devotional service. And when we find a way to serve, whether we're an accountant or a lawyer or a business person or an engineer or what me and you do, if we can find a way to serve and improve people's lives, then we'll be truly happy and successful. See, if you just have things, you may be successful, but not happy. And if you're just happy inside, then you may be happy, but you won't be successful. But when you do something you love and you serve people through it, you can be both happy and successful. And that's the goal. The goal is to be both. You don't have to, you don't have to choose. And so those would be the three messages from the Gita. You're an embodiment of that thought, Jai Shetty. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate you being on the show. Think like a monk out now. The link is in the description box. Jai's handles are in the description box. Thank you, brother. I really, really, really appreciate this. And it's it's a huge uh, honor and a huge pleasure talking to you after seeing so much of your content, reading so much of your content over the years, man. Bro, I'm grateful to you for doing what you do, for reaching out, for being in touch, for allowing me to share with your audience. I know that, you know, people absolutely love you and do what you love what you do. And so I'm really grateful and honored to be with you as well, because you're having such an amazing impact. And I want to thank you for being patient with me in the beginning while I was setting everything up today. And uh, you were so kind and gentle and, and, and supportive. And, you know, it, it just shows who you are off camera too. And I appreciate you for that, man. Thank you, brother. I'm learning a lot from you every day, every day. Following <laughs> thank you, you so much. Thank you, thank you, man. Thank you so much. For sure.